get started. It's just us tonight. I'm going to try to go short. But the shorter that I go, the longer I have to work at the old house. So we might just go all night so I can take the night off. <laughs> Danny asked me to bring him some dinner home on my way home. And I said, well, I'll see you about 1130. So... What, uh, what I want to do tonight, it's a little bit different than what I normally do. It's kind of teachy, kind of preachy. It's sort of in the middle there. It's in a really strange place. It may take us 10 minutes. It may take us 10 hours. We'll see. We'll see where we go. But what I want to look at <clears throat> is understanding the Old Testament like Jesus understood the Old Testament. So to set the background, Luke 24, 13 through 35. <clears throat> that's not where we're going to be, but that's where I'm going to talk about. There's these two men and they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. If y'all want to, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we'll go to. But these men are walking from Emmaus and they are immensely sad at what they had just witnessed. They were followers of this man named Jesus. And what had happened is that they had hoped in Jesus as their Messiah, their deliverer, their king, and they just saw their king get murdered. He was their hope, but now he's dead. And to make matters worse, some of the women of the company of the believers had visited the tomb and now they were claiming that the body of Jesus wasn't there. They, they claimed to have seen angels. And I imagine for these two men, it must have been too much. Because think about it. If someone comes to you and says, I've just seen an angel, you're, you're going to react with skepticism. You've got to remember that in this point of Jewish history, there had been no prophet and no word from God for 400 years until John the Baptist comes on the scene. And guess what? He was murdered too. So these men were very downcast and the news of Jesus body disappearing probably was like rubbing sulfur in the wound. Not only is the man we trusted in to be our deliverer dead, but now we don't even know where his body is. So then something happens. This man shows up and he's walking the same direction and this man begins to explain Jesus to them using Moses and the prophets. This is a very common expression, meaning the entirety of the Old Testament, the, the books that Moses wrote, the books the prophets wrote, and everything in between. So we've got the Old Testament, and he starts teaching to them. And, and, and then... They enjoy it so much that they invite him, hey, you've got to come eat with us. So he does. And after eating with this man, they have an epiphany. Wait a minute. That, that was Jesus. And he explained himself to us using Old Testament scriptures. you got to remember, there's no New Testament at this point that the New Testament's being written. So I heard a preacher say one time, he said, I want to understand the Old Testament like Jesus understood the Old Testament. And I think that's a worthwhile effort. So what I want to do is look at the story, we all know, David and Goliath, 
but I don't want to look at it the way that we always hear it preached. We always hear it preached as an allegory of you or David, you're, you're facing the giants in your life and you're defeating them with your little slings and, and rocks of faith. I don't want to look at it that way. I want to look at it through a lens of redemption. I want to look at the story of David and Goliath through the lens of the cross and maybe, just maybe, this was a story that Jesus used to explain who he was. I don't know. I wasn't there. You'll have to ask these two guys walk into Emmaus. I guess when you get to heaven, you can ask around. Hey, you ever been to Emmaus? You ever been to Emmaus? Well, they didn't even go to Emmaus. They turned around and went back to Jerusalem. You're going to have a hard time finding them. But there's three main players in the story of David and Goliath. There's Goliath. Big giant, big tall dude, massive dude. I think that his height was around nine feet. Huge dude, probably has bad knees. Andre the Giant kind of guy. Then there's David, little small dude, ruddy. This guy's still young at this point. He's not a king. He's not a soldier. He's not in Solomon's court. And then there's the Israelites, the army, the king, the cowards. What I want to do is I want to look at each of these characters as they pertain to the fallen nature of man and his relationship to Jesus. So, so you've got three main players, Goliath, the Israelites, and David. And I want to look at those through the lens of sin, humanity, and Jesus. I know it sounds confusing, but it's not. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 4 through seven. I even made my notes in King James. I hope I can pronounce these words. It says, and there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. If anybody is described as a span, that's a big guy. And he had a helmet of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass on his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, that's big, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So Goliath was very impressive looking and very strong. Goliath was a big man with big armor, brass, it's kind of cool looking, it's kind of goldy kind of looking, it's very shiny. He probably looked incredibly intimidating. In the same way, sin looks impressive and strong, just like Goliath did. When we look at sin and the allure that it gives to us, we tend to kind of dote on sin the same way that the Philistines did with Goliath. That, that the, the opposing army, at this point we'll say Christians, will look at sin and say, how in the world can I overcome this? Whereas the ones that are partnered up with it say, look at what we have to offer. Just look at the culture today and how much it worships and normalizes sin. It likes to hold it up, dress it up in its brass, and be very proud of its impressiveness. Not only that, look at verse number eight. And he stood and cried until the armies of Israel and said to them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Goliath, just like sin, taunts. Sin loves to get you riled up. Sin loves to boast about itself. 
Choose a man for you and come against me and let me kill him. Because I defy your armies. That's what sin says to us. You can't overcome me. I'm massive. I'm wonderful. Just give in. But the thing is with sin is that just like Goliath, the only thing that sin can offer is death. Is death. It may look impressive. You may want to go embrace it. You may want to fall down and beg for mercy from it, but it only gives death. That weaver's beam worth of a spear is going to go straight through your heart. Not only that, in verse number nine, listen to what he says. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. That's a lie. That is a bold faced lie. Do you think, does any part of you think that as Goliath is standing out there, that the king of the Philistines is saying, yeah, yeah, well, I'll totally give up my crown and become a slave to Israel if they kill Goliath. Are you kidding me? These are empty words because sin lies. Goliath is synonymous with sin. Sin lies just like Goliath is. He's promising all these things that he can't deliver. Is Goliath, is Goliath an emissary of the king? No, he's a soldier. He answers to the king. He's not able to fulfill these promises that he's making. And that's sin, is that sin gives these promises, but it does not deliver. It may feel like it delivers for a season. I can tell you from experience in my life, sin only delivers trouble, failure, pain, and heartache. And you will never hate yourself for overcoming it. Not only that, in verse 41, and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. Let me paint this picture a little bit. David has come out. He's accepted the challenge. I'm going to fight Goliath. So Goliath, who's a nine-foot-tall behemoth, comes out to meet him, but Goliath does something interesting. He has what's called a shield bearer. What is a shield bearer? A bearer? The, the word that we may be more familiar with would be the term squire from, from the Middle Ages and from the critically acclaimed movie A Knight's Tale. So a squire is someone that attends to a knight. Well, at this point in history, there's no knights, but there are soldiers, and this shield bearer attends to Goliath. Because guess what? Armor is hard to put on. And so someone helps you put it on. His shield bearer would help him put on his armor. Uh, shield bearers would actually clean the armor, beat out the dents of the armor. And the shield bearer here is carrying Goliath's shield. And Goliath is a coward. And I'll tell you why. Because normally a squire follows behind the one he serves. But here, he's sending his shield bearer out in front of him. I don't know if he's trying to get him to do some sort of messenger service. I don't know if he's just trying to say, you're not worthy of me, so I'm going to send my servant before me. I don't know. But Goliath can't even stand up man to man with David. He has to send a guy in front of him. And why is that? That's because sin is cowardly. Sin is cowardly. And why in the world would sin be cowardly? Why would sin flee from us? That's because in the presence of the light, darkness is repelled. When light, why is there a reason that when you are a Christian and you live it openly and you confess it, why is it that when you begin speaking of your faith, People that say they are close to you begin to scatter like cockroaches because you've turned on the light and they get to see just what they look like. 
It's one of the saddest things that Jesus ever said that you will lose family over him. And I believe probably all of us have lived through some part of that because sin is cowardly and it runs from the light. Not only that, verse 42, and when the Philistine looked around and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? Here you are coming with a stick. And the Philistine cursed David by his God. And the Philistine said to David, Come unto me, and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. He says, David, you're nothing. And then he cursed him by his gods. I don't know what that sounds like. You know, may the gods curse you, pox on your house. I don't know. But he said something, some kind of curse from his gods, which equates really to nothing because his gods aren't real. And then he says, I'm going to kill you. You're going to die. I'm going to leave your body there. And the animals are going to eat you. You're not even going to get a burial. Why, why would he do that? Because sin rages against God. Remember, later on, we're going to talk about how David is a, a, a type, a picture of Jesus here. Sin rages against God. That's its very definition in that sin is disobedience to God. He told us to do things. We don't do them. That's called sin. In fact, it goes even farther than that. James says to him that knows that to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Sin hates God. And then verse number 51, look at this. Then David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they bowed down in subjugation, right? No, they Led because sin flees at the victory of Jesus. Sin holds no power over the Christian because we are indwelled with him who is able to keep us from sinning. That is to say, you have the power to not sin. He's empowered you with it. And hopefully... Each day, we're a little bit more holy than we were the day before and the day before. We, we have a fancy word for that. We call it sanctification. That is to say that we're going to mess up. Paul said it. Oh, wretched man that I am. And then he used a bunch of confusing sentences. What I would do, I do not. But what I would do or what I would not, that's what I do. Great. Paul, he's a rapper. And so, Paul, if Paul struggles with this, Christian, you're going to struggle with this. But guess what? God's made way. Amen. Amen. And sin flees at the victory of Jesus. Do you struggle with a sin? I found that it's kind of hard to sin when you're praying. I found that it's Hard to sin when you're listening to a preacher on your phone. There's ways that we can fight against sin. We don't have to be a slave to it. We're free. Who the Son's made free, he's free indeed. And sin flees just like the Philistines ran away like the cowards they were because their giant guy destroyed. You want to know something? I'm just going to throw this out there. The Philistines were out there for 40 days. My question is... If their army was so strong, why didn't they just invade? Why did they have to use a scarecrow? Now, I'm, I'm not a, a tactical military master, but that just seems a little fishy for me that they have their army here and the Israelites here, and they're boasting like, man, we've already won this, but they're not charging. That has nothing to do with anything. I don't have anything spiritual to tie into that. That's just for free. 
Next, let's look at the Israelites. Verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Humanity. I want to talk about unredeemed humanity. Trembles at the power of sin. Here's Goliath out here shouting his curses and his challenges. And what does humanity do? It just trembles at it because it knows it can't overcome it. Because sin enslaves you. It's funny that Jesus said to some Jews, he said, you're going to be a slave, or, or he said that, that his people are slaves to him, and their response was, we're Jews. We've never been a slave to anyone. Or we're children of Abraham, I believe is the exact word they said. We've never been a slave to anyone. And I'm thinking Greece, Babylon, Persia, uh, you're literally under Roman occupation as you're saying that. I mean, there, there's four people that they're slaves to. And they're saying, no, we're free. What kind of delusion is that? And Jesus says to them, says, you're not a slave to me. You're a slave to sin. You're going to serve a master. It's either going to be him or it's going to be sin. And when we tremble at the power of sin because we don't feel like we can overcome it, which honestly, without the power of Christ, we can't. Look at verse number 20. David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse has commanded him. And he came to the trench and the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. Humanity attempting to face sin in battle. We're going to do it. We're going to take it down. Guess what happens? They cower down in the trench. They cower down in the trench and shake in their boots because sin is so mighty. If, if humanity can defeat the problem of sin, then guess what? Humanity can march all the way to heaven. Because they burned it. But then they marched to battle. And here's big Goliath right in the way. And guess what? All of a sudden, heaven's a little harder to get to. Look at verse number 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were sore afraid. Because humanity cannot stand sin face to face. They cannot stand up to sin face to face. They will lose. An unregenerated man who is a slave to sin, who's a slave to his passions, he's ruled by it. He's controlled by it. And here we have a Goliath in the way while humanity trembles. Because they can't overcome it. Verse number 28. And Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spake of the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why came you down hither? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the haughtiness of your heart. For you are come down that you might see the battle. I changed the vows to you. I just do it automatically. But David's brother is scolding David. And saying, you just came down because you wanted to see the battle. You just came down. You didn't have a purpose here. Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. Guess what? Humanity, just like this brother, does not wish to receive the son of his father. Humanity proved when Jesus came to earth that they did not want him. Rome didn't want him. The Jews didn't want him. The Samaritans didn't want him. Why? Because he upset the status quo. See, the Jews had a good little thing going. And Jesus upset it. 
they wanted to kill him. The Samaritans had their own little thing going, and he was a Jew. They didn't want no part of that because their worship was better than that of the Jews. And the Romans, they owned the world. What use do they have with this broke king, broke self-proclaimed king? Jesus comes to earth and is rejected. I've been asked before, how in the world could people see his miracles and reject him? And I'll tell you why. Because the God that he pointed them to requires faith to believe. Because there's going to come a point in history where this guy shows up. His name's the false Prophet, And what he's going to want to do is he's going to want you to worship the Antichrist. And what happens there is that he starts doing some signs and wonders. And guess what people do? They bow down and start worshiping the Antichrist. Why would they do that? Because instead of them being made in God's image, their God is made in their image. We can see him. We can touch him. I'll worship that. But worshiping a spirit, that requires too much faith. They did not wish to receive the son. Verse 33, and David said, or and Saul said to David, you're not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him. For you are but a youth and a man of war from his youth. Not only did they not want him, they don't believe in his ability. They don't believe in the ability of the son. You don't have the ability to do this. How in the world are you supposed to overtake Rome, Jesus? How in the world are you supposed to when you don't even have an army? They had at least two swords. And one guy willing to use them. He was a pretty bad shot, though. Only hit an ear. How in the world are you supposed to save us? Well, Jesus says that he didn't come to create war and to overtake Rome. Jesus came so that you may be born again. They don't want that. They don't want that just like they didn't want or believe in David. Here, look at verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put on a helmet of brass on his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword up about his armor, and he essayed to go, and he had not proved it. That means it didn't fit. And David said to Saul, I can't go with these, for I have not proved them. They don't fit. And David put them off. He took it off. Saul wanted David to look like his men. He attempted to make the son look like the world. I'll tell you this right now. Humanity has no problem with God at all. You can talk about God all day long. I believe in God, and that's great. People say that that's great because they make God be whatever they think. So God is love, right? Well, my definition of love is this unconditional, I never get chastised, I never get punished, he's totally cool with anything I want to do, he's like the dad that just sits and watches TV while I run a mug. That's love, right? No, that's not. But then when you talk about Jesus, things take a dicey turn. Because Jesus is... A little bit more difficult than just the idea of a God. A God can be whatever you want it to be. Jesus is very clearly defined in the scriptures. And Jesus requires a lot of you. In fact, all of you. And people don't like that. So they can conform Jesus into their image. And that Jesus, they're okay with. The Jesus that's kind of a rock star and loves you. The Jesus that 
is totally, honestly, let's, let's be honest here, it's just us. He's kind of a sissy. That, that's not him. Long-haired Italian Renaissance Jesus, that's not Jesus. And when he comes back with a sword coming out of his mouth, people are going to understand this. And they're going to realize that Jesus doesn't look like the world. Verse 52, And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley, to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharam, even to Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistine. And they spoiled their tents. They took their stuff. I mean, they didn't need it. They killed them. Israel had victory, but they only had victory, listen to this, after being rescued by Jesse's son. Israel had victory after Jesse's son saved him. Well, guess what? Israel can have victory today, too. But they have to accept the son of David from the line of Jesse. We can have victory. Humanity can have victory, but only after being rescued. That's why it's called being saved. If you pull someone off the railroad tracks before, a rain, before the train hits, you've saved them. If you rescue someone from drowning, you've saved them. If Jesus regenerates you and takes your punishment off of you, you've been saved from hell. You can be right with God. Verse number 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I can't tell. They're ignorant of the son's lineage even after victory. Even after the victory. Who's that? People, I'll tell you right now, we, we live... In the Western world, everyone is just churched enough to be dangerous, and everyone's just churched enough to be ignorant. This year, I, I read the Koran. Don't fire me. And I, I wanted to know. I was like, it, it surely, it can't be as bad as how it's painted. Uh, it's pretty bad. And uh, I do kind of like the part, Terry, where it says, if your wife's misbehaving, you're allowed to spank her. So that, that's right in there from the mouth of the prophet. I didn't say it. Also, if she makes you mad, you can have up to three wives. I don't know. I can't handle one. I can't imagine three. Goodness gracious. But here we had in the Quran, as you read it, it assumes you know Christian stories. And especially Jewish stories. Because it just builds right off of them. But the thing is, is that when it contradicts the Bible, it has to come up with something. So it comes up with the idea of, well, the Christian text has been distorted through history. Well, 40,000 manuscripts say that's not the case. So we've got to come up with something new. But the fact is, is that we live in a day and age now where people know enough to be dangerous and they know enough to be ignorant because most people have no idea who Jesus is. You'll say, do you know who Jesus is? They'll say, yeah, he died to save us from our sins. Well, what does that mean? Huh? What do you mean he saves us from our sins? Well, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. Just like Saul was ignorant of David. And really, he shouldn't have been. He literally tried to put his armor on him. I guess Saul's kind of dense. And I mean, Saul's son was his best friend. People are ignorant of Jesus. But now let's look at David. Let's look at David, and we'll be done. This one's very short. 
And I want to compare David to Jesus. Look at this. Verse number 17. And Jesse said to David his son, Take now for your bread an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to your brothers, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how your brethren fare, and take their pledge. David is sent from his father to bring life-sustaining bread. Guess who called himself bread? Yeah, we're putting it together here. We got the we got the the cogs kicking in here, just like Jesus. Jesus came to bring bread. I'm the bread of life. Eat, and you will never be hungry. David is taking some bread to the boys. Get them fed. Get them nourished. Get them ready for war. Guess what the Christian life is? It's not easy. It's war. I wish somebody would have told me that before I humbled myself before God. I didn't realize as a, as a child when I got saved that it required giving up your whole life. But guess what? I don't regret it. Look at verse number 25. This is cool. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that's come up? Surely to defy Israel he's come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and makes his, make his father's house free in Israel. Yeah, this is so cool. This is so cool. Through David's victory, he's given great honor and he's given a bride. Guess who else did that? Jesus, through his great victory over sin, is given the greatest honor that's ever lived. Read Hebrews. And he's given a bride. This church. And we get to be part of this. And it's going to be super cool because we get a marriage supper when we are redeemed as the bride. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I like weddings. We were just at one, you know, not too long ago. And... Fortunately, no one heard the uh, embarrassment that I was making on the piano in there. I'm glad uh, Beverly was stepped outside of the room. She might have got on to me. Love weddings. They're fun. There's nothing sad at a wedding. It's a joyous occasion. And if somebody is uh, making something of themselves, they tend to get escorted out. It's very nice. People have very low tolerance for nonsense at a wedding. Beverly's over here nodding. I almost got kicked out. And so here we have this beautiful picture in Revelation of the bride of the church and Jesus, the groom, coming together forever. Man, I kind of wish that was today. But David is given a bride and he's given honor by the king. Verse 26, and David spoke to the man that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who's this guy? Everybody else is shaking in their boots at Goliath and David shows up and he's like, who's this chump? Look at verse number 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go up and fight with this Philistine. Don't, don't let everybody be scared. I got you. I'll just, I'll just go do it. David doesn't fear the fight before him. Jesus didn't fear the fight before him. Jesus was tempted by the devil, man, and he came to the devil after he had been fasting for 40 days. Man, I don't know about you, but whenever I miss one meal, I'm easy to tempt. Jesus missed quite a few. And he used scripture to push the devil off. Not a problem. Not a problem. Jesus prays in the garden before the crucifixion story, and he says, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. It says he went to the cross despising the shame, but he knew the glory that was set before him. No fear. No fear. Verse number 34 and David said to Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and he took a lamb out of the flock, the bear did, 
And I went out after him, and I smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Your servants slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he's defied the armies of the living God. Are you getting what David said here? He says, I had a lamb, and a bear came and got me, right? So I went out and hit the bear. Dude, if a bear is carrying away my sheep, one, I'm probably just going to let him have it. That's cool. That's cool, Yogi. I've got more. But David goes out there, and, and number two, I'm going to try to kill that bear while it's carrying the sheep. No, David goes out there and hits it, man. And then the bear turns around to fight. David's crazy. But then he rises up, caught him by the beard, and he kills him. What? That means he's real close. If you were to come up and catch me by my beard, one, I might bite you. Two, you're really close to my face, and you don't want to be near a bear's face. So, so I've heard. My dad was kind of like a bear. I didn't like to get in his face either. But David has no fear of this bear, and he just wants a sheep back. They say, by the way, here's, your, here's a fact that may save your life one day. If a bear's coming at you or any kind of animal's coming at you, just make a fist, shove it as far down their mouth as you can go, and maybe it'll gag and run away. Or, you know, eat your arm. We'll see. It's, it's a gambit. But here David is saying, I killed this bear. Guess what? When it came to Goliath, that's nothing, man. I've killed a bear and a lion. A lion's worse. I have a cat at home. And if that cat was 10 sizes larger than what it was, it would probably eat my face because that cat is a jerk. I can't imagine how big of a jerk a lion would be thinking he's all big and bad. Imagine a cat that not only thinks he's better than you but knows he is. That's a lion. David says, I'm qualified for this fight with Goliath. Not only am I willing, I'm qualified. There's this beautiful story in Revelation chapter 4. John is in heaven, and here comes this scroll. And it's got these seals on it. And this scroll is like a title deed to the earth. And, and they're saying, who's worthy to open the scroll? Who in the world has done a redemptive act enough to inherit the earth? And they look around heaven and it's not me. It's not me. Moses says it's not me. Elijah says it's not me. Even Enoch, it's not me. What about you, Noah? You found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's not me. John begins to weep because there's nobody that can redeem the earth. It's destined to be terrible and cursed forever until he looks and he beholds a lamb that's worthy to open the seals that's worthy to redeem the earth, that's worthy to take the earth and make it his. Because it's already his footstool. Jesus was qualified for the fight. Verse number 40, and he took his staff in hand and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. So this is kind of cool. I, uh, I like slings. I would like to have one, but I'm afraid I would bust out a window at my house. So I don't, but a sling is an, a very primitive instrument, but also very, very effective. So what they would do is they would take a leather strap, put a rock, or some people, some would use a chunk of lead in that sling and begin to sling it around. Well, what happens when you get all that momentum on that rock? 
When you let that sucker go, that rock is like a bullet out of a 44 Magnum firing off, and it's going to take you down. We, we tend to downplay the fact that David used a sling to kill Goliath, but we have notes from history when the Spanish Armada breached into Central America and were fighting in through the Aztec Empire. It wasn't their warriors they were afraid of because their warriors had spears. You want to know what overcomes a spear? A musket. You can take down a spearman from 50 yards, no problem, with a musket. But you want to know what they were incredibly terrified of? They're slingers. An Aztec slinger was so accurate. What he would do is he would have his little stones or his pieces of flint or silver or whatever in the world they had on hand. He would sling that thing so accurately. The first thing he would do is he would take out a Spanish soldier's horse. Then when that man was on his feet, he would put another stone right in the helmet, the faceplate of the helmet where the helmet was open. And, uh, the results were exactly what you think, just like getting shot. A sling was a deadly instrument. And then they made it even better. They would put slings on the end of a staff, and then they could sling those things like 500 yards, long-range missiles on there. So the fact that he downed Goliath with a, with a rock Totally cool. He basically glocked him, man. He just shot him right in the head and then went and doubled over and chopped his head off like a boss. But the fact is, is that David goes into battle armed like a shepherd. Guess who else is called a shepherd? Jesus. And you want to know what he does? His rod and his staff comfort us because they are weapons of combat and they're defensive 45 then david said to the philistine you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield but i come to you in the name of the lord of hosts david comes in the name of the lord just like jesus came to glorify his father Verse number 49, David put his hand in a bag, took hence a stone, slang it, smoked the Philistine in his forehead, and that stone sunk in his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, so at this point in history, even though a sling is a valid weapon of war, guess what is not used for one-on-one -on -one combat? A sling. It takes too long to reload. Just like today, if you go to a fencing match, I don't, I don't know where in the world you'd find that. If you watch a fencing match on YouTube, they're not going to be pulling out AKs on each other. They're going to use little flimsy sword things made out of what looks like aluminum foil. David defeats Goliath through an unorthodox method. The sling is a long-range combat, mostly used for people like shepherds. Or warriors that are fighting from range, not within talking distance. Not only that, Jesus defeats sin through an unorthodox method. Jesus dies. Are you kidding me? There's no redemption story from any mythology where the hero dies to save a world. They overcome through their great power. Or Hercules, he overcomes through his great strength. Or really any, any anybody from Greek mythology, they, they overcome through the power of their you know, muscles. You have these Norse gods where they are almighty and powerful and they do not show weakness. And the minute that they do show weakness, Ragnarok happens and the world ends. Thor gets eaten by a big world snake and it just messes up everything. But that's not what happened in reality. Because reality is different than fiction. 
in reality, through his death, we live. And the fact is, is that how unorthodox was Jesus' defeat of sin? Not only did he die, but he beat that too. He didn't, he didn't even bother to stay dead. He went ahead and conquered that for us so that we don't have to live in fear. Verse number 51, And David ran and stood on the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head. Oliver would love this story. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. David cuts off the head of sin using its own sword. I think that's cool. Because Jesus defeats death or defeats sin using the very wages it pays. Jesus crushes the serpent's head using the cross, which was a tool that was meant to punish evil. They thought they were punishing evil. In fact, they were actually doing the greatest good. So in conclusion, the Old Testament is full of types and shadows of Jesus Christ, or at least it has enough of them in there for Jesus to preach a whole day to the men traveling to Emmaus. Don't disregard the Old Testament just because we have the new. It's the only Bible the first century Christians had. They had their Old Testament scriptures and they had whatever letters or gospels were able to be circulated around and copied. Through the lens of the cross, we can see that David was a, a type of Jesus. We were faced as humanity with an enemy that we could not defeat Jesus steps in and defeats that enemy for us. Now, just like Israel then, we get to live in victory knowing that sin no longer has to terrify us. We have complete victory in the finished work of Jesus Christ.